Hi, I'm Kim Williams at Kansas State University, and I'm pleased to provide this eGrow presentation covering some basics of plant growth and development. We'll begin by reviewing three basic plant processes, photosynthesis, respiration, and transpiration. It's important to know the basic details of these critical processes because we can manipulate and manage them during greenhouse production to influence plant growth and development, and thus crop quality and productivity. Next, we'll take a big picture overview of plant growth and development, thinking a bit about how the stage of development that the crop is in, vegetative or reproductive, should influence our crop management decisions. So let's start with the plant process of photosynthesis, which is a series of biochemical reactions by which plants convert light energy into their own food, which they use for growth. Specifically, carbon dioxide from the air and water in the presence of light are converted into oxygen and carbohydrates, or sugars. Though not technically true, it's useful to think in terms of photosynthesis equaling plant growth. That is, when we optimize the inputs of light, carbon dioxide, and water through our management, we maximize plant growth. There's no question that regulation of photosynthesis has a profound effect on the size of the plant. Let's spend a few minutes picking this idea apart. The first input into photosynthesis is carbon dioxide, which is a gas that's about 400 parts per million concentration in the air. It enters the plant through the stomata, or pores through which gases and water vapor move into and out of the plant. Stomata are mostly on leaf undersides, like the stomata on a tomato leaf that you see here. Plants have enzymes that fix this carbon so that it can be used in photosynthetic reactions. Grower action can influence carbon dioxide concentrations. The second photosynthetic input that we'll consider is water. Water application is, of course, under the complete control of growers who produce crops in protected environments, like greenhouses and high tunnels. Now let's consider the photosynthetic input of light. When the amount of light that a plant intercepts is greater, the more photosynthesis will occur, up to a point anyway. Optimizing light intensity for photosynthesis is at the heart of a grower's management of deciding when to pull shade cloth, or turning on supplemental lights. There's one more really important aspect involved in managing the rate of the photosynthetic process, and that's temperature. Photosynthesis is, after all, a series of biochemical reactions, and for every 18 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature, the rate of these reactions doubles to triples until a maximum rate is reached. Hotter than that, and enzymes in the plant begin to denature, suppressing the reactions until they stop. So what does all of this mean for the grower? Well, the rate of photosynthesis depends on the availability of several inputs, water, light, carbon dioxide, and appropriate temperature. If any one of these factors is limiting, photosynthesis will slow or stop. Consider these research results from, which were adapted from work by Gastra in the 1960s. The rate of photosynthesis is on the y-axis, and we have light intensity increasing along the x-axis. As light intensity increases, the rate of photosynthesis also increases, up to a point anyway where we see these photosynthetic curves leveling off. As light intensity becomes so great that the photosynthetic apparatus is damaged, then we see a leveling off of the amount of photosynthesis occurring. Next, consider the effect of temperature. When the temperature is a toasty 86 degrees Fahrenheit, photosynthesis occurs at a faster rate than when the temperature is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Finally, Consider carbon dioxide concentration. When it's only 300 parts per million, right here, regardless of the temperature, when it's only 300 parts per million, you can see that the photosynthetic rate is much lower than when the CO2 concentration is 1300 parts per million. 
So what's going on here is that it's the carbon dioxide concentration that's limiting the photosynthetic rate. It's the weakest link at that point. So the reason that it's important to understand the inputs into photosynthesis is to appreciate that whichever input is limiting will control the rate of photosynthesis and thus plant growth. That brings us to the plant process of respiration. This series of biochemical reactions takes carbohydrates made during photosynthesis and metabolizes them to yield energy for plant growth and development, as well as carbon dioxide and water. The maintenance of life, let alone growth and development, requires continuous use of energy. Therefore, it makes sense that respiration occurs all the time, 24-7, during the night and darkness, as well as during daylight. Does photosynthesis occur during every hour of every day? No, no. Light energy is required for photosynthesis, so it occurs only during daylight. And this idea brings us to a brief discussion of compensation point. This is the point at which the rate of photosynthesis equals the rate of respiration. Photosynthesis occurs only during the day because light is required. Respiration occurs in all living cells at all times. So when photosynthesis exceeds respiration, the plant grows. When photosynthesis equals respiration, we're at the compensation point and no net growth occurs. When respiration exceeds photosynthesis, what's going on with growth? Yeah, the plant is in decline because the plant is metabolizing more carbohydrates than it is producing. So consider conditions of very low light levels, like in some interior scapes. The light level can be so low that the amount of photosynthesis that occurs only equals respiration, or perhaps doesn't even keep up with respiration. In these cases, new growth will stop, or the plant will decline towards death. Another way to think about compensation point is to consider another input into photosynthesis, carbon dioxide. At a CO2 concentration of about 50 to 125 parts per million, the amount of photosynthesis that occurs will about match the rate of respiration, which means that there will be no net plant growth. Finally, consider temperature. Naturally, temperature is higher during the daytime than during the night which means that photosynthesis and respiration occur at faster rates during the day. But respiration, which is the only of the two that occurs at night, is slower at night. This allows for a net gain in growth, with photosynthesis outpacing respiration. But what about if we run the greenhouse temperatures at a negative diff, where the day temperature is lower than the night temperature? Well, photosynthesis would slow during the day, respiration would be increased at night, so the net growth gain would be impacted. Next, let's briefly consider the process of transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water from a leaf in the form of water vapor. This water vapor is lost through the stomata, which are open during the day when carbon dioxide enters leaves for photosynthesis. About 90% of the water that enters the plant is lost through transpiration, which serves three essential functions for the plant. It cools the plant, it moves nutrients and sugars through the plant, and it keeps leaf cells turgid, which is another word for plump. This plant process is important to understand as we decide when to irrigate based on, for example, how bright and sunny it is outside which is an environmental condition that drives plant transpiration. So if it's bright and sunny, plants will be transpiring at a, a faster rate. Need for water increases. You know, so we've been talking about plant growth like we agree on exactly what it is. What would you say is a nice, precise definition of plant growth? Hmm. How about an irreversible increase in plant size and or mass, which is another word for weight? Well, 
Are we talking about fresh mass or dry mass? Dry mass equals the weight of the plant's organic and inorganic constituents, whereas fresh mass is all of the dry mass plus water content. And it turns out that fresh mass actually fluctuates over the course of a day. If you think back to our brief discussion about transpiration, you can imagine why that occurs. So fresh mass is probably not a fantastic definition of, of uh, plant growth. Okay, so say we decide that growth is an increase in plant dry mass, but as seedlings develop, they lose mass prior to increasing in mass. Yet we still think of the seedlings as growing through this period of, of, of a decrease in mass. Thinking back to your knowledge of seed germination, why does the loss of mass occur? Well, because stored food reserves in the seed are metabolized as the radical or seed root and the cotyledons or seed shoots emerge. So until the seedling can photosynthesize on its own, dry mass will be a net loss. We could keep going picking apart a definition for growth, but you get the idea. The question is, how do we optimize plant growth? And the answer is by controlling the factors that control growth. And these are, seriously, if you don't have some ideas that come to mind, I'm going to have to jump off a really tall building. Because indeed, the factors that control plant growth are the inputs into photosynthesis. Light and temperature are two huge ones. And then, of course, we have carbon dioxide and water. But there's also grower practices like fertilization. Are there enough nutrients like nitrogen to incorporate or assimilate into the enzymes which are necessary to fix that CO2 in the first place? Grower practices like pest control, mechanically manipulating the plants, applying plant growth regulators, all of these things are also going to impact our, the way that we control plant growth. Okay, so what's plant development? This is the process by which cells become specialized and differentiate into recognizable tissue, organs, and organisms. So visualize as a plant grows cells differentiating into, first of all, a specific tissue, and then a specific organ, like a leaf versus a flower, etc. A sigmoidal curve represents a pattern of plant growth and development for crops like these chrysanthema. And so basically we can consider that growth cycle um, as being broken down into five phases. We start off with the lag phase and then we go into the log phase of growth. What do you think happens when we get to a decreasing growth rate up, up here at C? What's going on with the plant? It's shifting from vegetative to reproductive growth. And then we have a steady state phase and then senescence. Keeping the pattern of growth and development in mind for different crops allows us to think in terms of matching our production practices to the stage of development. Propagation, vegetative growth, reproductive growth. For example, when would you say fertilizer concentration should be increased? Well, you're probably not going to need so much fertilizer during the lag phase of growth. What about during the steady state phase? Some, but that's really not where we need to make sure it's maxed out. It would be during the vegetative growth phase or the log phase during the, the, the B part of the sigmoidal curve. When would you decrease fertilization rate then? Well, certainly when the plant is uh, senescing, it doesn't need nearly as much fertilizer. So thinking about 
when during plant growth we should implement various cultural practices like fertilization, like when we apply plant growth regulators and how that might impact flower bud initiation, for example, is an important part of, of thinking about um, how to optimize plant growth and development. We'll end by considering the life cycle of the plant, which is essentially then the production cycle of greenhouse crops. And it's the same. It's got the same backbone for all species. We start with the propagation phase, and that can either be from seed or cutting, or tissue culture, actually. Then we move into vegetative growth. And for some crops, especially perennials, we have to be aware of a juvenility phase or reproductive vegetativeness or you know vegetative dormancy so there are things that are crop specific that we need to be aware of during production um, let me just define juvenility for you uh, it's that when plants must attain a certain size before they're able to initiate flowers as an example we have lavender which needs to have 40 to 50 leaves prior to beginning a cold treatment cold treatment is necessary for flower bud initiation, the next stage of development. Now, there are different uh, cultural inputs into accomplishing flower bud initiation, like for some crops a cold treatment or a specific day length for photoperiodic crops, or both in some cases. Some species, like a lot of bedding plants, are simply light accumulators. But in floriculture, our ultimate goal is flower bud development. So we have this backbone of the plant production cycle for all of our floricultural crops. And for specific species then we're looking at understanding the inputs into these different stages of the plant growth process. So how do we control plant development? The ultimate control is through genetics. That is to say if you want to have a short variety of a plant See if you can start with selecting a cultivar that's naturally shorter. Um, but of course there are lots of things that we do as growers that will influence plant growth and development. And the first big one that we could shout out is light. By manipulating light, we're manipulating of course photosynthesis, but then we also have aspects of light that influence uh, photoperiodism, photomorphogenesis, um, of course the light intensity is something that we've been talking about a lot with photosynthesis. Juvenility period that's determining by plant size, which is an impact of light on the light accumulators. We have light quality influencing things like uh, plant height. And we can control plant development with temperature, of course. Um, certainly rate of growth as we've been discussing is influenced by temperature but there are also other aspects like therm thermoperiodism, um, negative diff which I mentioned earlier. We control plant development with chemicals, phytohormones like gibberellic acid substitution for dormancy when we produce crops like azaleas. We've got high control um, thanks to GA inhibitors or growth retardants. We can also physically manipulate plant growth, <clears throat> like instigate water stress or nutrient stress, um, pinching, thigmomorphogenesis, which is brushing tomatoes to manage plant height, for example. So there are many production systems and recommended cultural practices that are successfully used for each crop. Each grower has a different way of doing things. And that always begs the question, well, which production system is best? The answer is varied. It could be the system which has the lowest cost, the shortest production time, results in the highest crop quality, each grower may have a different uh, set of conditions which result in the best answer to that question. So that's really the production dilemma then for the greenhouse grower. Which production system is best? How should I manage my cultural inputs to optimize plant growth based on my goal of 
producing crops at the lowest cost or producing the highest quality crops or having a shorter production time and so on and so forth. And therein lies the fun of greenhouse management and floral crops production. This basic uh, introduction to plant growth and development is simply provided as a foundation from which the rest of the eGrow presentations will hopefully make a bit more sense. I want to end by gratefully acknowledging my colleagues at partnering universities and by sincerely thanking the Fred C. Glockner Foundation for providing funding for the eGrow presentation series.